Welcome back to the Early Career Immunology Seminar Series. For those of you returning, thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tim O'Sullivan, an Assistant Professor of Immunology at UCLA. The purpose of the seminar series is to increase the exposure of early career faculty in a time in which we have not yet achieved equity and representation at scientific conferences and seminars, despite equally innovative discoveries. We're excited to have Tanya Friedman with us today. Tanya received her PhD at UC Berkeley, where she elucidated the structural mechanisms underlying the activation of RAS nucleotide exchange factors, SOS and RAS GRF1. She then trained with Art Weiss at UCSF during her F32 funded fellowship, where she discovered the mechanisms by which Lin A tunes macrophage responses. Tanya then started her own research program at the University of Minnesota, where her lab studies the molecular processes that modulate the activation threshold of macrophages and other cell types in health and disease. If you have any questions for Tanya during her talk, go ahead and type them into the chat box and I'll ask these questions at the end of her talk. Tanya, thanks for being here today and take it away. Thanks so much, Tim. And yeah, it's just so great to be here. This has been a phenomenal series and it's, it's just so much fun to participate and get to know all of the other assistant professors that are in this series and looking to see the future ones as well. So my lab at the University of Minnesota is in the Department of Pharmacology and located in the Center for Immunology. And as Tim said, we are really interested in the processes that modulate in responses, and particularly the fundamental mechanisms that um, allow cells to integrate different inputs through different pathways and sort of parse these different inputs into a single appropriate functional outcome. Okay, so as everyone here knows, the immune system has a really tough job to do because it has to respond incredibly powerfully and quickly to a threat, a pathogen, and generate an inflammatory response. But it also has to be incredibly choosy about what it responds to because it's constantly being buffeted by debris and non-pathogenic factors that could bind a cell's receptors but should not be translated into a strong outcome. So all cells, uh, adaptive and innate immune cells, are constantly evaluating the stimuli that they encounter in order to process an appropriate response. Myeloid cells in particular are fascinating because they're so plastic and they can achieve many different functional states. And while a lot of great work has been put into understanding how they achieve these balances and what factors may polarize them for one function or another, um, there's a lot that's still not understood about how cells regulate these thresholds and parse these different inputs from different pathways. So, these cells do this in a number of ways. They can tune the functional kinetics, both at the molecular level of when a protein will become activated and deactivated, and also how a pathway and a process evolves to tune, say, inflammation up at the site of a wound and then to tune it down for wound healing and resolution. They can bias which pathways will become activated in different polarization states and different tissues with different stimuli. Um, and even uh, by different cell types. And they can also modulate their sensitivity to activation, either transcriptionally or again, sort of through a more sort of molecular adaptive process of responding to one stimulus and then another. So macrophages are a great poster child for this plasticity and modulation. And I'm just gonna give a brief overview for the, for the more junior trainees in the audience. So they have these canonical functions that rely on these modulation strategies in order to achieve a correct um, function in the body. And I have this little dial showing these things can be tuned because these are again are plastic processes. So famously macrophages are involved in tissue reform where they can repair in injuries, maintain tissue homeostasis, support organ development. They can um, have roles in innate immunity where they detect pathogens directly and orchestrate an adaptive immune response. They can also become dysregulated and drive chronic inflammation in the case of autoimmune and inflammatory disease. And they can support uncontrolled tissue growth, such as when they are recruited to the tumor microenvironment and manage T cell responses, promote metastasis and decrease therapeutic e efficacy. 
So all of these processes together um, are potential outcomes of the cell type in a specific tissue at a specific time. And again, uh, we have some of the pieces that are driving these different changes, but the totality of this picture is still not fully clear. One thing that underlies a lot of these regulatory decisions by macrophages and other myeloid cells are the activity of the Sark family of protein tires and kinases shown here. So fascinatingly, a lot of these signaling processes through all of the different receptors that you see, which can drive pathogen sensing, autoimmunity and development, cancer progression, rely on initial regulatory signaling through the same Sark family of kinases. And often they even rely on similar downstream signaling machinery like MAP kinases, AKT, NF kappa B signaling pathways. So regulation um, of, uh, of all of these pathways together by the Sark family becomes really important for translating an environmental milieu into a, a functional state of the cell. And just by way of a little introduction to the Sark family kinases, they themselves are regulated by phosphorylation. And here I've drawn the canonical domain structure of a Sark family kinase where they have these internal activation sites, a unique region, and then these modular domains with canonical phosphorylation sites um, in the activation loop and inhibitory tail. So in a cell, typically these kinases are in the inactive stage where they have inhibitory phosphorylation and this auto-inhibited assembly, which limits access to the activation loop and peptide binding and catalytic activity. These kinases can become active when this inhibitory site is dephosphorylated and the activation loop can become transphosphorylated, opening up the structure, allowing these um, SH2 and SH3 domains to bind P, uh, phosphatyrosines and PXXPs intermolecularly and then freeing the kinase up to receive substrate. So one of the fascinating things about the SARC family is there's a lot of members actually. And the SARC kinases, especially SARC and YES, are expressed in every cell and have this canonical regulatory structure that drives general growth, proliferation, survival pathways. And this is partly why they're important as proto-oncogenes. But in the immune cells, um, immune cells have sort of an extended battery of these Sark family members. And fascinatingly, different types of immune cells have different constellation of different Sark family members. For instance, myeloid cells typically have some combination of LIN, which is in two splice forms, LIN A and LIN B, which will become important later, HCK also in two forms, figure and fin, whereas B cells have BLK and um, some LCK and T cells have LCK and fin. And so it's really sort of an understudied area to, to try to figure out how these different Sark family members and their effects in combination may be sort of helping these cells to achieve their um, cell character through some of these same canonical pathways. So as I said, my lab is trying to understand how these cell, cell processes are regulated, and in particular, how the cell family is involved in regulating these different functional discrimination processes that I said before. And you know, we, we also are, are studying other things besides the cell family kinases in our lab, but to be honest, a lot of the projects just come right back to the cell kinases because they're that fundamental to, to these regulation processes. So in my lab, we have projects that are just very basic signaling mechanisms to understand how cells regulate their activation thresholds. We have projects in um, inflammatory and autoimmune disease, such as inflammatory arthritis and lupus. And we also study the triple negative breast tumor microenvironment. But starting with this idea of pathogen sensing and um, signaling thresholds. So a typical myeloid cell, for instance, a macrophage, uses ITAM coupled receptors slightly differently than a T cell, which can trigger with very low number of, of cross-linked T cell receptors engaging with peptide MHCs. A myeloid cell, on the other hand, has ITAM coupled receptors that are thought to function more as size sensors to report a direct encounter with a big pathogen. So this could be cell wall beta glucans interacting with dectin-1 
MEITAM or IgG decorated bacterium interacting with FC gamma receptor. But these sort of engagements from a micron sized particle generate these large micron sized clusters of ITAM coupled receptors. These allow the SARC family kinases to phosphorylate both the ITAM and the SIC kinase, um, which is the next tyrosine kinase downstream. And then together, these kinases initiate a general antimicrobial response for the cell. So this will involve phagocytosis, actin side skeletal arrangement, and also activation of second messenger pathways, um, starting from PLC gamma and PI3 kinase. And then together, these signaling processes drive things like BERK, phosphorylation, AKT, and fat activation, and f kappa B pathway, and then ultimately a transcriptional response. Um, so along the way, there is direct pathogen killing by releasing reactive oxygen and nitric oxide, of course, coupled with phagocytosis. And in part for this reason, this process is really most effective when a myeloid cell is directly opposed to a pathogen. Otherwise, it will secrete these toxic molecules. And then if the pathogen isn't at close range, the cell is causing needless tissue damage um, and sort of inappropriately activating. So recognizing this very close and direct pathogen encounter is of the utmost importance for proper regulation of these cells. But aside from this direct killing response, these macrophages and other myeloid cells can also um, produce inflammatory cytokines to create the inflammatory response, and then also um, signal to the adaptive immune system. And then also these pathways drive polarization pathways, which increase strength of a subsequent response to, um, to a pathogen. So these cells are, are basically regulating, retaining a memory of this encounter for the next time and driving adaptive immunity and killing so all this together then is sort of optimally positioned for when an infection is directly detected. In contrast, um, we and other groups have shown that if a nanometer scale low valency um, receptor ligand engages the same ITAM coupled receptors, even if there's a lot of it and a lot of receptors are engaged, um, the cell largely will ignore these types of stimuli. And that's a good thing because of this tissue toxicity and chronic inflammation risk that I told you about. And these, um, these lower valency ligands are thought to be fairly abundant as far as people know. These can be low valency beta glucans, so sloughed off bits of fungal cell walls left over from an infection, but not attached to a fungal cell. They can come in through our intestines from the food that we eat. And they can also be formed from these sort of smaller self-immune complexes that aren't sort of rising to the level of a real particulate uh, identified as a cell matter. So a cell really does discriminate. And most macrophages and dendritic cells um, have this really good ability to discriminate a pathogenic encounter from just pure receptor ligation. And they do this through a number of mechanisms that are, are fairly well described to different extents. And all of these mechanisms can work together to sort of drive a cellular decision. So one of these is uh, kinetic segregation, where it's thought that the close contact between the particle and the myeloid cell will lead to the exclusion of the phosphatases CD148 and formation of an integrin stru signaling structure that basically protects this activated signal zone in the middle of this phagocytic cup. And these lower valency ligands are unable to sort of organize this higher order structure. There's also mechanisms triggered directly by, by the SARC family kinases. For instance, they can phosphorylate and activate the Sybil family of three E3 ubiquitin ligases. And then these can poly or monoubiquitinate targets to either change their activity or target them for degradation in this pathway. The CERC family kinases, and in particular the LIN kinase, are also thought to phosphorylate ITIM containing proteins and inhibitory ITAMs. And these create docking sites that allow recruitment and phosphorylation of lipid and protein phosphatases 
and invoke negative regulatory functions of some adapter proteins to mislocalize signaling complex, allosterically inhibit them, or um, in, induce phosphatase activity. Again, that can shut off second messenger lipid signaling or just de reverse the phosphorylation cascade that initiates this pathway. And finally, this other mechanism, which I discovered in part in my postdoc and followed up on in my independent lab, that relies on a unique positive regulatory function of just one of these forms of LIN, LIN A, which we call the LIN A checkpoint that uses LIN A as a rheostat to help um, determine the sensitivity of the cell to stimulation. So I'll go into that a little bit more now. So this is the canonical antimicrobial signaling response, just for perspective here. So here we're using depleted zymosin, which is an extract from yeast. It's three microns. We've measured it by light scattering. It's about three microns in diameter. It's comprised of beta-glucans that um, ligate dectin-1 and cause these microscale clusters of receptors. So when we treat a bone marrow drive macrophage with depleted zymosin, we see the canonical antimicrobial pro-inflammatory signaling cascade. It starts with recruitment of sarcomely kinases and then fo activating phosphorylation of sick, which leads through these other processes to um, downstream phosphorylation of things like PLC gamma and PI3 kinase, which generates some second messenger signaling, and then downstream activation of MAP kinases, AKT, and fat and transcription. And I'm just showing you a few components of the pathway here, but you can really see this going all the way down to a full antimicrobial response. So in order to sort out what the clustering of the receptors was doing, aside from inducing activity of the Stark family kinases and access to substrates, in my postdoc, I used a an approach that was developed in Art Weiss's lab at UCSF, in which we were able to use a small molecule to induce our family kinase activation in the absence of receptor clustering, and then compare the dectin-1 um, depleted zymosan response uh, to a direct method for activating the Stark family kinases. So to do this, um, we used a, a trick, basically, where we could um, thwart basal regulation of the Stark family kinases. So as I told you before, the sarcomely kinases are inhibited by phosphorylation on this inhibitory tail. And the kinase that does this fairly selectively is CSK, C-terminal sarcinase. So CSK phosphorylates the site, which makes the sarcomely kinases sort of wrap up and become inhibited. What I didn't tell you before is that this is a highly dynamic process because constant activity of CSK is in competition with the CD45 and CD148 phosphatases that are continuously dephosphorylating the site. So we, so in the West lab, Jamie Shanborn and Art in particular thought that if they inhibited CSK, possibly that could lead to the activation of the sarcomyces. Uh, and this is this is showing just that if CSK is inhibited, then the phosphatases can work unopposed, and the sarcomly kinases will become phosphate. So in order to do this, we collaborated with Kayvon Chokat's lab at UCSF to design what's called an analog sensitive version of the CSK kinase. So this is a quaint mutation of CSK in which the active site has a substitution um, that doesn't ablate the kinase, kinase activity of CSK in itself, but basically opens up, changes the shape of its active site in a way that it will accommodate a designer inhibitor that will inhibit this mutated version of CSK and not the other kinases in the cell. And this is called the analog sensitive version of CSK or CSKAS. So then in the CSKS system, um, and a grad student in the lab, Ying Tan made a mouse which expressed only CSKAS as a transgene. In the basal state, the cells are pretty much normal where the CSKAS is able to compete with the phosphatases to keep these sarcomely kinases regulated. Um, but then when this selective inhibitor is added, 3 of epp one then CSK can go ahead and um, it is blocked from its activity and the Sark family kinases become activated. So the original work using this system was done in T cells, but 
in my postdoc, I decided to, to try this with bone marrow drive macrophages because macrophages, as I said, have this unique I-10 size sensor. And I thought that that would be a unique opportunity to understand like what the sarcomely kinesis were doing aside from receptor clustering. So here's the proof of principle experiment. We derived um, bone marrow drive macrophages from the CSKAS mice. And I'm showing you here immunoblots from whole cell lysates, showing that in the basal state, most of the sarcomely kinases, all these bands here on these immunoblots are in the inactive form. So this is an antibody against this phosphorylated inhibitory tail. But then very quickly, so again, look at the time frame. So three seconds, six seconds, when you add this inhibitor of the CSKAS, you very, very quickly lose this tail phosphorylation and gain activation of phosphorylation, showing that these kinases are becoming very, very rapidly activated. And we'll note how, how little of these inactive uh, phosphorylation sites remain. So this is really a bulk activation of pretty much all the sarcomely kinases in these macrophages. So with this in hand, then we could go back to our comparison of signaling um, with a pathogen encounter, a depleted zymosan um, mimicking, mimicking the pathogen, which causes fairly robust membrane proximal signaling all the way through this MAP kinase response. Um, and we actually see quite a big difference with this 3IBPP1 treatment. So with Sark family kinase activation and the absence of induced receptor clustering, we see extremely strong phosphorylation of SICK due to the extremely strong activation of the Sark kinases. And that gets translated into a fairly rapid phosphorylation of PLC gamma and PL PI3 kinase. But then um, surprisingly, there is the signaling blockade in between sort of at the point of the second messengers um, that that frustrated further signaling. And this was true for ERK, AKT, and FAT, and, and F kappa B, all the pathways downstream that we looked at. So clearly the strength of SARC family kinase signaling was not the only story here, and that there was a signaling blockade downstream. We also found, um, I would say fortuitously, that this signal that was dying over time was correlated with a loss of one of the SARC family kinases, Lin A. So you can see here the decrease over time during this activating through IBPP1 treatment. And this is quantified here just in bone marrow direct macrophages. We also found that this seemed to be unique to Lin A, where if we looked at HCK, the shorter slice form of Lin, Lin B in macrophages or FIGUR, or in T cells, LCK or FIN, um, that Lin A seemed to be the only one targeted for this rapid degradation. And then this corresponded to uh, Lin A activation occurring on a really different time frame from the other sharp family kinases, where they're all being activated sort of simultaneously. Maybe Lin is activated even faster than the others. But then Lin A is activated as a pulse that rapidly disappears, whereas the other Sark family kinases have a more persistent activation profile that, that lasts much longer. And actually, the half-life of activated Lin A is only around a minute in these cells. And the other Sark family kinases are five to 10 fold longer than that. And so really in this time frame where we have the signal dying off and ERK failing to be phosphorylated is corresponding to this loss of Lin A protein. So when I started my own lab here at University of Minnesota, my first PhD student, um, the brave Ben Bryan, uh, decided that he wanted to get to the bottom of how Lin A was being targeted for degradation. And he chose to start with a candidate approach because the civil family of E3 ligases is known to bind to the SARC kinases and degrade most of them on a much slower time frame. So Ben crossed the CSK AS mice with C Sybil knockout and Sybil B knockout mice, and then looked to see um, how Lin was affected by activation in these bone marrow drive activations. So you can see here from the block that in the normal AS cells, you lose Lin over time. But in the C-Civil knockout, actually, Lin is much more persistent. And you can see that quantified here. And most importantly, 
in this early phase where you get really rapid loss of Linne in uh, Sybil expressing cells, you really get almost no rapid degradation of Linne in that time frame in the C Sybil knockout. In the Sybil B knockout, we don't see the same effect. In fact, we see slightly more rapid degradation. And we believe that's due to the upregulation of C. Sybil in the Sybil B knockout cell. So it's sort of a nice proof of principle that the rate of Linne degradation during activation seems to really hinge on the level of C. Sybil in these cells. So then, Knowing now that C. Sybil is the candidate and it's, it must be targeting Linne through a different mechanism because it's doing so on such a more rapid time frame than the other star kinases, we decided to look at the sequence determinants of Linne that was responsible for this phenomenon. And to do this, Ben took this easy comparison between the splice forms, Linne and Lin B, since they had such different kinetics of degradation. So, a little more about Linne and Lin B, what I didn't tell you before is that they are so closely related. They're different only in 21 amino acid insert in the Lin A unique region that's absent in Lin B, and that's in this sort of less conserved unique region near the end terminus of the protein. And the first thing we noticed was that there was a tyrosine right in the middle of the site. And it was potentially a phosphorylation site, but had never been described in immune cells. So in order to test the sequence determinants of this degradation, we were forced to move to an ectopic expression system where we put in a CSKAS construct, our Lin construct, and extra C civil into Jerkat T cells, just as an easy cell system to work with that we can get lots of DNA into. But we found that under these conditions, this difference in degradation between Lin A and Lin B was preserved. And so that allowed us to go forward and test what was mediating this more rapid degradation of Lin A. And so to make a long story short, none of the mutations that we looked at, including a potentially evicted patient site, made any difference in the degradation of rate of Linne, except for this tyrosine 32 residue. And if we changed it to an alanine or a phenylalanine, then it basically converted Linne into a Lin B degradation profile. And so this made us think that maybe this was a site of tyrosine phosphorylation that could be recognized either directly or indirectly by C. Sybil. So um, in order to detect and quantify this phosphorylation, we turned to mass spectrometry approach, where we took um, bone marrow derived macrophages either at rest or with activated Sark family kinases during 3 ib 51 treatment. And we did a co -IP, or an IP for Linne. And then we excised fragments out of the gel corresponding to non-ubiquitinated or polyubiquitinated uh, linear protein. So using isotope labeled peptides to make standard curves, we were able to quantify the amount of Y32 phosphorylated peptide in these various samples. And here we're looking only at the non-ubiquitinated species in resting and linear activated cells. And we see increase in uh, y, a phospho Y32 peptide, a fairly dramatic increase um, during Lin A activation, suggesting that this was an induced phosphorylation site um, in response to activated Lin A. We were also able, in just the 3 of BPP1 treated samples, to compare the amount of this tyrosine phosphorylation in the non ubiquitinated compared to the poly ubiquitinated um, forms of Lin A and found that there was a selective enrichment in phospho Y32 in the polyubiquitinated forms. So we took this to suggest that, um, that, poly, that this Y32 phosphorylation might be a prerequisite for polyubiquitination. And in fact, this could be um, the mode by which Linne was flagged for degradation. So we knew before that high valency interactions were required for a full macrophage response. And now we can refine this idea a little bit to say that we believe that CERC family kinases, perhaps altogether, are able to mediate this response and partly some, um, some mechanism of receptor clustering allows all the CERC family kinases to participate or protect Linne from degradation. And in my lab, we're still trying to figure out the root cause of that. 
But now we have this added timer mechanism, which helps to protect macrophages and other cell types from spurious activation by either stochastic serpent lipase activity or by low valency ITAM receptor ligation. And in this mechanism, as LIN A becomes activated, it becomes autophosphorylated, autophosphorylated and recognized by C civil for polyvipinination and degradation. And for some reason, in the absence of the clustering of receptors, LIN A is strictly necessary for transmission of the signal from upstream membrane proximal signaling proteins to a more downstream fully activated response. And at this point, we um, were fascinated that this seems to be a unique function of LIN A because in these cells, remember, LIN B is still fully activated and present, HCK and FIGUR are as well. And somehow the selective loss of LIN A is, is the key thing for transmitting this signal. And the other surprise that we had really is where this signaling blockade signaling checkpoint is occurring because most of the canonical negative regulatory signaling we know works really far upstream. So these phosphatases like SHP1 and lipid phosphatases are, um, are, are affecting some of these more membrane proximal signaling apparatuses. Um, but this signaling is being really frustrated farther downstream than we had uh, envisioned. So this is also something that it's a matter of unwilling study in our, our lab. But I think the key takeaway message is that there's this kinetic mechanism that helps macrophages discriminate between ligands that um, seem like a direct pathogen encounter from other ligands that may just activate sarcoma kinases in a, in a manner that is less appropriate and that these cells are really carefully discriminating and not merely using signal strength as a proxy for when it's an appropriate time to become activated. So I told you that when the sarcoma kinases alone become activated, uh, that's not sufficient to fully activate a macrophage. What I didn't tell you is that we found a way to overcome the signaling blockade. So if we treat macrophages with inflammatory cytokines, such as interferon gamma, um, at low dose overnight, then we see an even stronger membrane proximal signal, uh, and then that leads to full cellular activation. We found that LIN is also at the root of this phenomenon, and that it becomes activated, or sorry, it becomes upregulated um, in inflammatory conditions. So our theory then was that just increasing the dose of LIN in the cell, and most likely LIN A here, um, would allow it to overcome this sort of degradation mechanism and maintain a threshold level for activating the cell. We tested this hypothesis by combining a total LIN knockout, which is what we had at the time with, with our CSKAS mice and showing that in the absence of LIN A, although um, other signaling like phospho PLC gamma is not completely blocked, a downstream ERK or AKT response is. So it appears that this LIN signaling is the critical thing, or at least one of the critical things necessary for this inflammatory priming to increase the sensitivity of these cells. Another part of this puzzle is a coordinated regulatory process by which C. Sybil controls the amount of LIN in these cells. So I showed you before these data from Ben um, showing that C. Sybil alters the rate of degradation of LIN. But if we show these data a different way and just focus on this zero time point, that the loss of C-Sybil actually increases the steady state amount of LIN A protein. And we think this could just be due to um, basically Le Chatelier's principle that if there's a small amount of basal, the activated LIN A that's constantly being degraded, then over time, the levels of LIN A protein will be but either way, in these feasible knockouts, a much higher threshold of LIN A is maintained over time and in this basal condition. This is also true at the RNA level, though, as well, where if we take macrophages in the dish and polarize them into these sort of canonical, you know, in culture M1 and M2 conditions just by adding simple um, inflammatory cytokines onto them, that 
In the more pro-inflammatory conditions, we see upregulation of LIN-A mRNA, sort of recapitulating our protein finding, but we see a, somewhat of a downregulation of C-Sybil mRNA. And then the opposite, if we use more tissue remodeling M2 conditions, we see downregulation of LIN-A mRNA and at least a slight upregulation of C-Sybil mRNA. So it appears that LIN-A and C-Sybil both at the mRNA and the protein level are acting as this coordinated regulatory node, which can really tune this rheostat effect of lin A in, in macrophages. But beyond these environmentally sensitive, um, these environment sensing functions, we were also wondering if this lin A C civil coordination could function differently in different types of immune cells that have canonically higher or lower sensitivity to activation. So Ben looked on InGen and found that mast cells, which are, are these cells that actually, unlike macrophages and dendritic cells, are known to be able to trigger with many, many fewer uh, ligated receptors. So FC epsilon receptor is just much more trigger happy than FC gamma receptor. But mast cells expressed very little C symbol mRNA and much more civil B. And so we took this as sort of a natural test case to, to test our theory about this coordinated regulation of C-Sybil and LIN. So Ben made bone marrow drive mast cells and found both higher steady state expression of LIN A um, in this absence of C-Sybil and then also maintenance of LIN A levels over time as opposed to this degradation profile that we see in bone marrow derived macrophages. And this was accompanied by um, the increase in ERK phosphorylation, where sarcomely kinase activation alone in mast cells was sufficient to generate an ERK response, unlike in resting unprimed macrophages. So again, this supports that, you know, in different cell types that may tune C civil differently or tune when expression differently, that this can really contribute to this cellular identity of where this activation threshold is. We were also able to manipulate this process to some extent by inducing upregulation of c sybil and mast cells. So to do this, we used a small activating RNA to increase c sybil transcript levels, which then led to increase in c sybil protein expression. And as we expected, that led to a decrease in LIN-A protein over time and a blunting of this herb response downstream. So I told you before that LIN has this molecular timer mechanism where it's activated as a pulse and then its rapid degradation can suppress downstream signaling in the absence of a full receptor clustering interaction. But there's this additional feature of this mechanism where LIN acts as a rheostat and LIN and c civil working together will tune the expression level of LIN A at steady state and then maintain it at higher levels over time. And that can allow a cell in an inflammatory environment or a particularly sensitized type of cell like a mast cell to, um, to sort of bypass the signaling checkpoint and become a much more sensitive type of cell. So it has exquisite environments, cell type and transcriptional control of this LIN rheostat. So I've been telling you a lot about this, these pro-inflammatory functions of LIN, and we think primarily LIN A based on this degradation and based on the fact that all this activated LIN B is not able to compensate for the loss of LIN A. But really, we don't know very much about the functional differences between LIN A and LIN B in immune cells or any cells generally. There's two really good studies that come to mind where people have tried to look for this. One is from Juan Rivera's group at the NIH where they reconstituted either LIN A or LIN B into LIN knockout mast cells and suggested that LIN A might be the more pro-inflammatory splice form and LIN B might be the more immunosuppressive splice form. And then there is a, a pretty good paper from Matt Smalley uh, and Juicy Turnio in Cardiff where they were looking at LIN A um, expression in breast cancer cells actually, and finding that higher LIN A expressing cells relative to LIN B were more aggressive, metastatic, predictive of poor patient prognosis. But aside from those two studies and, and our contributions in LIN A, there was very little known. In part, that was because 
only models we had in these total Lin knockout mice, which obviously would lose both the positive and negative functions and overlapping functions of these two splice forms. But we do have some sort of starting place to be able to evaluate signaling functions due to these Lin knockout mice and um, Lin knockout phenotypes. So one thing we know about Lin is that in humans, loss of function alleles are risk factors for lupus SL. And this is an autoimmune disease that many of you will know about that includes nephritis, inflammation, anti-nuclear antibodies, ultraviolet sensitivity, pain, and many other symptoms. It's a huge problem. It's hard to treat without blocking immune function and leaving patients susceptible to infection. So trying to understand the regulatory mechanisms that go into this progression uh, of disease is, is pretty important. The knockout mouse, it turns out, recapitulates many of these uh, symptoms of disease. So these disease indicators like nephritis, loss of B cells due to a blockade in B cell development, um, myeloproliferation, splenomegaly are somewhat parallel in these mice compared to in humans. So in order to be able to dissect the different contributions of Lin A and Lin B in a much more rigorous way, our lab set out to design Lin A and Lin B splice fixed single knockouts, which wasn't entirely trivial because these are, as I said, two different splice forms. And the splice site that differentiates them is located in the middle of exon two of Lin. So, um, so this is just a diagram showing the Lin transcript and showing these two alternative splice sites to make Lin B use this five terminal. Um, Five prime alternative splice site in the middle of exon two, make Lin A is just sort of the normal exon intron exon junction. So, to make a CRISPR version of this in collaboration with core facilities at the University of Minnesota, um, to make Lin A knockout, we use two guide RNAs to, to cut a chunk out of this unique insert in Lin A and then rely on non-homologous end joining to create a frame shift and stop premature stop codon in this putative Lin A transcript. So then we would end up with no functional Lin A, likely due to nonsense mediated decay, but an unaffected Lin B. For Lin B knockout, we used a single guide RNA to cut right at that splice junction, and then added a donor oligo, which contained Point mutation that ablate the splice site. So through homology directed recombination, we have a single point mutation version, which allows Lin A to be produced, but no Lin B splice product. And this is just an immunoblot of bone marrow drive macrophage lysate showing that we lose Lin A and Lin B as expected in our single isoform knockouts. So I told you that this version of Lin A does have a conservative a valine to leucine point mutation in the unique region of Lin A. And so this was a concern. And so I just, I won't go into all the details, but we did a number of controls to ensure that this wasn't going to mess up Lin A function in the Lin B knockout. So I'm just going to summarize this really briefly and then and go on to our findings. So our controls for Lin A function, our most important one, I think, is that we crossed homozygous Lin A knockout and homozygous Lin B knockout to create uh, what we call Lin A B hemi mice that have one allele each of Lin A CRISPR and Lin B CRISPR. So they end up expressing normal amounts of Lin A and Lin B, but the Lin A that's expressed will be this B24L. And then we can compare this to the wild type and ensure that the, phenotypic, the phenotypes of these hemi mice and wild type match to ensure that Lin A is functioning normally in, in this altered form. We also proved through transfection experiments that this Lin A B24L and wild type Lin A were able to initiate signaling comparably in, in response to 3 BPB1. So, in this, we used a cell line that relied on this transfected Lin A to initiate any signaling at all, and we see no differences in signaling there. We also showed that the degradation profile of this Lin A was identical from. Uh, identical compared to wild type. And I think this is a, an especially neat experiment because it shows that Lin B is completely unnecessary for Lin A degradation. 
So when I said before, we think this autoclass correlation, we had some evidence for that from our previous work, but this is even more sort of solid evidence that Lin B does not mediate degradation of Lin A, that it seems to be really self-contained. But anyway, by all of these metrics, we have not detected any real differences between this um, Lin A and the well type Lin A. And so we're just proceeding with these mutants uh, and characterizing them. So um, one thing that we were surprised about actually is that if we knock out one isoform of Lin, we get an, a compensating upregulation of the other one. And this is through, true for both Lin B protein in the Lin A knockout and Lin A protein in the knockout. And this was particularly fascinating because if you just take a Lin A plus minus mice, um, a mouse, then it has about half the amount of both isoforms. So this appears to be something really specific where these cells are detecting each isoform individually. And, and furthermore, doing this independently of the other sarcomely kinases because those kinase levels are not altered in any of these cells. But in order to study what we wanted, which was more physiological levels of the remaining isoform, we ended up defining our Lin A and Lin B knockout mice as het null crosses, where we had a homozygous Lin knockout cross to a total Lin knockout so that we would have Lin B expressed from only, only one allele. And then we got these physiological expression levels. So these are the mice that we'll be characterizing in the next set of experiments. So now on to looking at lupus phenotypes. So one of the first things we checked was the nephritis phenotype which is basically caused by immune cell infiltration and also antibody and complement deposition. And these are just H and E stains of glomeruli from mice that are eight months old, which is when the total Lin knockouts are really developing the disease in our lab. And we see much more immune infiltration and these sort of irregular looking glomeruli in the Lin B and the Lin knockout mice, but not in the Lin A knockout. And you can see this, this scoring here where the dark yellow are these severe glomerulonephritis scores. And you can see that they're more populated than just the B knockout and the total knockout. We did a similar experiment to look at the presence of anti-nuclear antibodies in serum. And this is just a sort of antibody positive or negative test, not quantitative. But if we look at different samples more consistently, the Lin B knockout and total Lin knockouts uh, we detect uh, the presence of ANA and not so much in the Lin A knockout in wild type. And similarly, um, we find more complement in the kidneys of Lin B knockout and total knockout than we do in Lin A knockout in wild type. So often the Lin A knockouts might have a more mild version, but the Lin B knockouts are consistently as severe or almost as severe as the total Lin knockout. So this is all suggesting that Lin B might be the primary suppressive um, isoform of Lin because its loss is inducing a more autoimmune phenotype. So looking at some of the adaptive immune components of this, these are the cellular experiments are all still works in progress because we're preparing this paper for resubmission and refining our methods and reanalyzing some of our data. But Monica Sauer, a PhD student in my lab, has really been taking the lead on this. And we found some pretty interesting things so far. So the first is, despite the fact that the Lin B knockout mice seem to be getting these lupus phenotypes, uh, Lin B, um, sorry, loss of Lin B does not um, cause this lymphopenia phenotype. So in the total Lin knockout, it's been known that the defect in B cell receptor signaling leads to a failure of selection. And so you, you get a developmental block basically where a lot of your B cells are deleted. And it seems like expression of either Lin A or Lin B is sufficient to really restore B cell development. And to me, that's really fascinating because we're still getting this ANA phenotype and some of these other adaptive manifestations of the disease. But broadly, the B cells uh, of the Lin B knockout look much more like wild type than Lin knockout. And so this is something interesting to, to me is that there, there could be different drivers of disease that's going to, that are going to be really interesting to sort out. So moving to the more myeloid manifestations of this disease, I told you before that there's a splenomegaly phenotype where the spleens become enlarged due to proliferation of myeloid cells. Again, we see that Lin B 
knockout have these massive spleens compared to Linnea knockout. And you can see that quantified here. And again, I want to point out that this Kenny control mouse looks indistinguishable from wild type and not really like this sort of milder Linnea knockout phenotype, again, suggesting that these are good models. And then again, the cellular data, I think, honestly, are, are still a little bit um, to be refined. But just as a quick first glance, looking at the myeloproliferation, so when we look at cells in the spleen, we see um, much more of a trend where the LIN-B knockout is similar to the total LIN knockout. So more of classical intermediate or control monocytes relative to LIN-A knockout and wild type in, in all these cell types. And, um, and so this, this is suggesting that lin B knockout really does have a profound effect on um, this myeloproliferation and that lin B is likely suppressing the, the overproduction of myeloid cells in functioning really differently than its somewhat more redundant role in B cells. We also have some of these uh, lupus relevant cell pathways that we're still in the process of sorting out if LIN-B knockout is really different. So here we have many more LIN-B knockout plasmacytoid dendritic cells, again, key drivers of lupus and spleen. Uh, and the, the thing that we're struggling with right now is that we seem to have actually fewer total LIN knockout PDCs and, and the same with macrophages. And right now we're not sure if we're losing some of our more highly inflamed cells in our analysis or if LIN-B knockout is actually even worse in some cases than the total lin knockout, which, which could very well be the case. So we're, we're trying to, to figure out what we think about that. But the story in general is that in the lin knockout, they are very severe disease generally, but the patterns of, adapt, of B cells and myeloid cells are a little bit different. So here is just showing um, one more piece of data, a spleen architecture showing BT20 as the total numbers of B cells and showing that, again, LIN-B really does have somewhat wild type levels along with LIN-A knockout. And in the total LIN knockout, you really do lose, you can see this lymphopenia, um, this B cell lymphopenia. Whereas the germinal center B cells also look, um, at least between LIN-A and LIN-B, somewhat similar. And then um, they've lost their structure and there's probably more of them in the LIN knockouts. As opposed to this myeloid cell stain, where wild type and lin -A knockout have these blunted numbers of myeloid cells compared to the increased um, production of myeloid cells in both the lin -B and the lin knockout cells. And the architecture of these germinal centers and follicles are shown here with this progression from highly organized to sort of more and more disorganized as you go through here. And that's also reflected in the H and E state. So, one final observation is that. Um, we're trying to understand the un underlying signaling that's come from this. And so far, our signaling experiments have not painted a very clear picture about the individual roles of LIN-A and LIN-B. And of course, we're just at the beginning of these analyses. But one observation that we've had is that there may be a difference in TLR4 expression, which could lead to different TLR4 signaling in these cells. So toll-like receptors are also risk alleles um, for for human SLE and inducers of autoimmunity in mice when they become hyperactivated. And when we look at cells from the peripheral blood of these aged mice, we see that both the LIN-B knockout and the total LIN knockout have increased expression of toll-like receptor four uh, on their surfaces. And this through B cells, neutrophils, and monocytes is a consistent trend. So, um, I think future studies will go to try to understanding the patterns of TLR4 expression and signaling and to try to understand if these are drivers of the disease or symptoms of the disease. But, um, but either way, it's sort of a, a, an intriguing idea, I think. And finally, one more thing I wanna point out is that uh, an astute reviewer said, well, you showed us a lot of bone marrow drive macrophages. There's clearly more lin B than lin A. So is it possible that you're just losing more protein in your lin knockout and that's why your disease is more severe? So Luis Ramirez and Arandica Senevarasna in my lab did a series of um, preparations of different cell types and compared the relative expression of lin A and lin B in each cell type. 
And you'll see these extremes on the end actually, which I find fascinating. So B cells, which um, Lin A or Lin B seems to be able to compensate to, to promote BCR signaling, at least in the context of development, actually express more Lin B than Lin A uh, by a bit. Whereas dendritic cells, which have one of the most severe Lin B knockout phenotypes, express more Lin A than Lin B. So I think the patterns here are not very clear. It's not clearly tracking with expression level. And I think this is really enforcing the idea that there are going to be functional differences between these proteins. And we just, you know, we're right at the beginning, we have the tools and we're excited to, to figure them out. So do these proteins contribute differentially to positive and negative regulatory system? I think we can, we can say we, um, we think so based on the sort of long-term outcomes of these signaling process in these processes in these mice. And we clearly have to add in now the toll-like receptors, the ITIN signaling and the ITAN signaling, and probably all of these other receptor pathways to be, um, to be able to understand this final picture of how this is all regulated. But what I've told you today is that macrophages and all these other myeloid cells and even B cells to some extent control their reactivity in all these different ways. They control the functional kinetics of their signaling protein activation, for instance, modulating Lin A levels in very acutely in real time to be able to suss out the difference between a direct pathogen encounter and frustrate signaling if one is not detected. They can control their sensitivity to activation, where the environment or the identity of the cell tunes when they as a rheostat and um, enables signaling in highly reactive mast cells or in an inflammatory environment while dampening signaling in macrophages and dendritic cells in a, a non-threatening resting environment or in tissue remodeling conditions. And I'm showing you the different um, expression of Lin A and Lin B potentially target cells to different fates, encourage proliferation or reactive signaling or inflammatory signaling differentially in different pathways. And we're at the beginning of starting to understand how this fits into a bigger picture. But I think what I'd like to leave you with is that it really is important to try to understand the mechanistic basis of all of these myeloid cell functional responses. And in part, just because it's completely fascinating and there's so much Un unappreciated about how these processes work. And also because if we, you know, if we determine the underlying causes of all of these things, we can end up using this little dial over here therapeutically and, and trying to be able to target these cells specifically instead of developing therapies that just ablate the immune response or kill tissues, which is the current modality for things like autoimmune disease and cancer. And, you know, being able to, to rewire some of these cellular responses could ultimately be a much safer and more effective therapy. So with that, I, I'd like to thank my lab, my former PhD student, Ben Bryan, who's now a postdoc at Berkeley, the current PhD student, um, current co-first author on the upcoming resubmission, Monica Sauer, postdoc JT Green, and all the other people in our lab who have um, contributed to this work. Also our collaborators at the University of Minnesota, especially Bryce Binstad, um, who has helped us a lot with some of the autoimmune disease stuff, and uh, also Cliff Lowell at UCSF, who has helped us with some of the pathology and scoring um, and our funding. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and take questions. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that fantastic talk. So I think, uh, Justin actually has a question for you that he typed in the chat, but I don't know if Justin wants to just ask you directly. Uh, sure. <clears throat> Fine, make me talk. Um, so is very nice. I wonder, you know, given the importance of lipid metabolism in pro-inflammatory macrophages, particularly in regulating TLR4 expression and, and signaling and and, and that, of course, CERT kinases generally can be lipid modified post translationally. I wonder if you have any thoughts or evidence of if, if the Lin family is, is being regulated by lipid modification um, in the inflammatory context or in any context, and, and or 
Is it the signaling the other way? Is the LIN signaling inducing changes in, in lip, lipid metabolic state? That's a really good question. Um, so LIN signaling is certainly changing the lipid metabolic state by things like phosphorylating items and activating SHIP1, which is a, a phosphonositol phosphatase. And, um, and so that, that's certainly there. And LIN can also be modified, you know, it could be delipidated and it could be lipidated. But I know much less about how that would impinge on this inflammatory signaling, but I, I agree it, it's something very worthy of study and something we should be adding in, into our complex analysis. Okay, great. So we have another question from Maria in chat. Um, she says, great talk and beautiful data. She wants you to ask if you can speculate how this signaling decision could occur in vivo and which stimuli could control it in macrophages or other leukocytes. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's the big question, I guess. I think what seems clear to me is that macrophage in an inflammatory environment, so at the site of an autoimmune affected disease, disease affected tissue in a tumor or you know, near an infection, but not encountering pathogen directly, we speculate could participate in some of these sort of you know, cohort inflammatory responses. They could get sort of tricked into providing extra chronic inflammation and their upregulation of LIN um, would you know, allow them to be, participate more in bystanders, which could be good in the sense of amplifying an inflammatory response, and it could be bad in developing tissue damage or chronic inflammation. Um, I think what, what we're really not clear about yet is how different tissue pathways are feeding in, because a lot of our preliminary studies were done in these simple systems, adding in cytokine without these sort of complex tissue interactions. And I think it's very possible that the tissues themselves are providing a check on that in some sort of regulated way. And I think it would be really fascinating to see if we can identify, you know, we could start even with just co-culture experiments and seeing how some of these cell-cell interaction signals or tissue damage signals, you know, feed into some of this. But I agree, it's, it's something we're interested in as, as next steps. Okay, um, if there's any other questions in chat, please leave them for Tanya. Tanya, I think you can circle back to some of the questions that will be on the YouTube page and you can address those afterwards. Um, thanks again for joining us. Um, really appreciated your time and, and thanks again for your fantastic talk. It's off.